I actually had, want to begin by going back to Freud and hitting a couple of loose ends. There was a point in my lecture on Wednesday um, where I skipped over some parts. I said, we don't have time for this, and I just whipped past it. And I couldn't sleep the wee over the weekend, been tormented. Um, I shouldn't have skipped that. And, and I want to bring, hit, let me tell you why I skipped it. The discussion I skipped was a discussion of why we would have an unconscious at all. So I was talking about the scientifically respectable ideas of Freud, and I want to talk about some new ideas about why there could be an unconscious. Now, the reason why I skipped it is I'm not sure this is the best way to look at the question. As we will learn throughout the course, by far the vast majority of what our brains do, the vast majority of what our minds do, is unconscious and we're unaware of it. So the right question to ask may not be why are some things unconscious, but rather at why is this tiny subset of mental life, why is this conscious? On the other hand, these claims about the utility of unconsciousness I think are provocative and interesting, so I just wanted to quickly share them with you. Um, so the question is, from an evolutionary standpoint, why would an unconscious evolve? And an answer that some psychologists and biologists have given is deception. So most animals do some deception. And deception, defined broadly, is simply act or be in some way that fools others into believing or thinking or responding to something that's false. Um, there's physical examples of deception. When threatened, chimpanzees, uh, their hair stands up on end, and that makes them look bigger to fool others to thinking they're more dangerous than they are. Um, there's an anglerfish at the bottom of the ocean that has a rod sticking up from the top of its head with a lure to capture other fish, to fool them in thinking that this is something edible, and then to themselves be devoured. But humans, primates in general, but particularly humans, um, are masters at deception. We use our minds and our behaviors and our actions continually to try to trick people into believing what's not true. We try to trick people, for instance, um, into believing that we're tougher, smarter, sexier, more reliable, more trustworthy, and so on, than we really are. And a large part of social psychology concerns the way in which we present ourselves to other people so as to make the maximally positive impression, even when that impression isn't true. Um, at the same time, though, we've also evolved very good lie detection mechanisms. So not only is there evolutionary pressure for me to lie to you, for me to persuade you, for instance, that if we're going to have a com if, if, if you're threatening me, don't threaten me. I am not the sort of man you could screw around with. But there's evolutionary pressure for you to look and say, no, you are the sort of man you could screw around with. I could tell. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you become a good liar? And here's where the unconscious comes in. The hypothesis is the best lies are lies we tell ourselves. You're a better liar, more generally, if you believe the lie that you're telling. Um, this could be illustrated with a story by, about Alfred Hitchcock. The story goes, he hated working with, ch with child actors, but he often had to, and the story goes he was dealing with a child actor who simply could not cry. And finally, frustrated, Hitchcock went to the actor, leaned over, whispered in his ear, your parents have left you and they're never coming back. The kid burst into tears. Hitchcock said, roll them, and film the kid. <laughs> and the kid, if you were to see him, say, that's, boy, he's re he really looks as if he's sad, because he was. Um, <laughs> if I had a competition uh, where I give $100,000 to the person who looks the most as if they are in pain, it is a very good tactic to take a pen and jam it into your groin. <laughs> because you will look extremely persuasively as if you are in pain. If I want to persuade you that I love you, would never leave you. You can trust me with everything. It may be a superb tactic for me to believe it. And so this account of the evolution of the unconscious um, is that certain motivations and goals, particularly sinister ones, are better 
made to be unconscious because if a person doesn't know they have them, they will not give them away. And this is something I think we should return to later on when we talk about social interaction and social relationships. Um, one other thing on Freud, uh, just a story of the falsification of Freud. I was taking my younger child home from a play date on Sunday and he asked me out of the blue, why can't you marry your mother or your father? <laughs> now that's actually a difficult question to ask, answer for a child, but I, I tried my best to give him an answer. And then I said, um, then I thought back on a Freud lecture. And so I, I asked him, if you could marry anybody you want, who would it be? Imagining he'd make explicit the Oedipal complex and may name his mother. Um, instead, he paused for a moment and said, I would marry a donkey and, <laughs> and, and a big bag of peanuts. Both, both his parents are psychologists and he hates these questions and sometimes he just screws around with us. Okay. Um, last class, 